We are going to go into the Old Testament this morning. Haggai, or Haggai, I always pronounce it wrong, but I like it better that way because I'm a mainer and we say things we, the way we want to. <laughs> and I'll do some of that because I know it says, I, I think it's pronounced Shealtiel is who Zerubbabel is the son of, but I like Shealtiel, it just seems to flow better to me, so I do what I want to. So if you hear me pronounce anybody's name in the course of doing this, I do it my way, because I have no clue. I don't have anything that tells me how. I could look it up, I could listen to it, but you know, we know who it is, because we're reading it. Anyway, it's, uh, we finished Matthew last week, and uh, if you're going backwards through the Old Testament, there's Malachi, then there's uh, Zechariah, and then you come to Haggai. Yeah, I said it right. <laughs> so, let's pray. And uh, then we'll, we'll look. By the way, it's on page 1333, too. Let's pray. Lord God, it's so good to be gathered together in your house on this day. And we just pray, Lord, that you would uh, speak to us. Lord, we're here to know you better. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us to just separate any external voices that would try to crowd into our mind. And Lord, that our focus would be on you and on your word and what you would say to us this morning. We just love you, Lord, and we just want to hear from you. So bless our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. So, history. The real history, not what you learn at school. You know, not eons and eons ago, there was this ooze somewhere in a puddle that gets struck by lightning and life form, <coughs> you know, and all that other crazy stuff they want to tell you. But God created the, the heavens and the earth. And I was having this discussion with my doctor a couple weeks ago, because he's, he's a Christian, but we're just talking about how much faith it takes to believe in a primordial ooze and lightning hitting it and spontaneous regeneration and, you know, but whatever was created then has to have the ability very quickly to reproduce. So you think of what really would have to happen for the whole story of evolution to be true. It's not. But talking about how God created the earth, and not only that, but all of the, the heavens, but he didn't just create the stars, he had to create the light that travels from the star to earth so that we could see it. He didn't create Adam as a baby, he created him full grown. So when they talk about, I mean, it certainly looks like the world, like creation, is older than it <coughs> is because God created it with time into it, if that makes sense to you. He made things mature when he made them. He didn't plant a tree that someday grew into an oak, plant a seed, you know, he, he, it was an oak tree. There were birds, full-grown, mature birds flying around. So some of uh, what they look at when they try to determine the age of things is just looking at what God created into his creation. But anyway, Adam and Eve in the garden doing great. Um, serpent comes, tempts Eve, they sin. Sin enters the world. And so what we have in the, the story of human history is the failure of man to obey God but also all of this rest of Scripture, you know, it only took us three chapters to fall. Three chapters, and we've got sin in the world. But all the rest of Scripture is God's desire to, to restore the relationship that was lost with his creation back in the garden. That's what this is all about, all the way through. So we come through Genesis, and we see that God chose Abraham to be the guy that he would bring his son into the world. Because in Genesis 3, it talks about that one day, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. So that God would send his son. That's where the first, it's the proto-evangelium is what it's called, but it's the first statement by God that he will send a deliverer. <coughs> and that deliverer would be his son, who would be Jesus. That, that seed, the seed of the woman. And so as we go through the Old Testament, we see God narrowing down who his son is going to come through. And it begins with Abraham. And then, of course, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Um, you get to the end of Genesis, the nation of Israel. 
Jacob's name changed to Israel. He has 12 sons. All those guys, about 70, go down into Egypt because of the famine. And the purpose was God wanted to put them in a place where they could just grow into a, a big nation, a powerful nation, which they did. Two million guys, 400 years later, left, traveled through the desert for 40 years because of their rebellion still. They are a stiff-necked and rebellious people. They remain that to this day, as do we. I mean, all of us, are, are we've got the same attributes. But after 40 years in the desert, Joshua leads them into the promised land, which is uh, a lot that we can say about all of this, but just a brief history is what I'm trying to do. Get into the promised land, and they're conquering, and they're doing well, but you know, sin continues to be a problem, and it does continue to be a problem, doesn't it? And so ultimately, though God wanted to be their leader, in the time of Samuel, the nation cries out for a king. They want to be just like every other nation. And so God relents. He tells Samuel, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. So Saul becomes king. After Saul is David. And then Solomon, who built the first temple. And what a glorious thing that was. But Solomon's kid, Rehoboam, um, they come to him after Solomon dies from the nation of Israel, and they want to uh, just lessen the tax burden. See, taxes, complaining about taxes, it didn't just start in our country. It's been going on a long time. And so Rehoboam went and asked his dad's counselors, what do you guys say? And they said, well, you know, if you ease up a little bit, you'll own these people. They'll follow you. You know, I'm paraphrasing a little probably. But anyway, you know, It'd be a good thing. So then he went and got counsel with the guys he grew up with. And you know, there is, there is wisdom in going to someone who circled the planet a few times more than others. You know, age does bring us insight and wisdom a little bit. But anyway, he listened to his buddies who told him, no, you better be hard on them or they're going to take advantage of you. So he, he rejected their request. Anyway, so... The nation of Israel is divided. Ten tribes go with Jeroboam. Um, Judah and Benjamin stay together um, and become Judah. So there's a, a distinction there. The ten tribes ultimately are invaded by the Assyrians because of their rebellion. They set up false gods, Jeroboam did. And so they get captured. And what we have then later on, though, because of the sin of another king way down the line, Manasseh, the Babylonians come in and conquer Judah. And they go into captivity. They're in captivity for 70 years. It's astounding as you look through the Old Testament. And you read in the book of Jeremiah how God told them, it's going to be 70 years, you're going to go into captivity because you're so idolatrous, i got to deal with you. And so he sent them to Babylon. There was no place that was more idolatrous than Babylon. You want idols? We'll give you idols. Here you go, you know. And so um, that's what happened. Well, a lot of prophets, a lot of prophecy through all that time. And then we come after the 70 years. In the book of Isaiah, there were prophecies about a, a, a Gentile king that will come to power, a, a warrior named Cyrus. And so in the scriptures, a hundred years before this guy is even born, this prophecy is written down that he will be the one to allow the Jews to go back to their homeland and rebuild a temple that was destroyed by the Babylonians when they came. It's astounding how scripture reveals all these things. And so they showed him that and he said, hey, that's me. So he allowed them, after 70 years, to return to the land. Haggai, here, is the first prophet to write after that exile in Babylon. Most of the prophets are either leading up to, during, or during the Babylonian captivity. But when you get here to the last three in the Old Testament, they're after that captivity. 
after they've been allowed to return. And not only did Cyrus say return, he said, well, not only that, build the temple, pray to your God, because I want his blessing on my life. So I want you to, I'm going to give you all the resources you need to build the temple. Of course, they get back there. And this is where we'll pick up as we read through Haggai. They get back there to build the temple. And those who are living in the land, they don't want that to happen. Anti-Semitism. They hate the Jews. And they don't want them in the land. I've heard that somewhere. I don't know. That, that might be relevant. <laughs> to our day and age. So anyway, verse 1 says, In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, and we'll get into what he said first, but this is not the King Darius from the book of Daniel. This is another king. You know, it's, it's a title more than a name. But this, uh, and this prophecy actually begins, it's the end of August in the year 520. We got a date stamp here, which is the first, sixth month, first day of the month in the second year of Darius. So that 520 BC, um, the end of August, which is 18 years from when Cyrus said that they could return and build the temple. When they get back into the land, with, and you can read about it in the book of Ezra, they're really excited, and they get right after it. And they're starting to build, but problems arise, you know, people attacking and that kind of thing. And so, in the year 534, after being there for two years, construction on the temple stops. And so then... Um, Haggai, Haggai shows up, he's been there, but anyway, the Lord speaks to him at this point, 14, I mean 14 years after that, in 520 BC. Now he speaks to um, these two guys, Zerubbabel and Joshua, it's the religious leader and the civil leader in Judah, and Zerubbabel He's a descendant of Jeconiah. He's the last, who was the last legitimate ruler in Judah before the captivity. So he's, he's in the lineage. He's a, he's a good guy. And he says, hey, you know, here in verse 2, thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, this people says the time has not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built. So in other words, for 14 years, they haven't done anything, and they say, well, it must be God's will. They're blaming God for their own um, hesitation, I guess, or, or maybe their complacency. It, it, well, if God wanted me to do it, it we wouldn't have all this trouble. <laughs> that idea, which is certainly not true. But in reading this, you know, it, it just it reminds me of who we are, who we could be, who we shouldn't be. Because it's real easy to say, well, if I'm meeting resistance, it certainly can't be God's will. Or, or my life's just too busy, I don't have time. You know, so many today would say that. And I'm and just reminded, though, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We'll start there. I'm going to bounce around Scripture a little bit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I, I think of this a lot, you know, Paul writing to the Corinthians, he says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same um, spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. So in other words, the Old Testament, a lot of it is for our example. Reading on, verse 7, And do not become idolaters, as some of them were. 
As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the end of the ages have come. Now I, I love to think of it that way, okay? So Lord... All these stories in the Old Testament, why have you preserved them down through to today for us? Because they're good examples for us. Good reminders, good things to, for us to consider. Because I, I always look at life this way. I'll give you insight into me. I think you probably know because I think I've shared this before. But, you know, what is the Lord's house? When we think of that today... When we consider that, if you go back a few pages to 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, Paul wrote, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Or back to chapter 3, go back another page or two, in verse 9, For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's Field. You are God's building. And so the idea that, you know, the, the temple now is our flesh, that God wants to dwell in us. We invite Jesus to come into our life. And so when you think of the temple and what it represented, it was the spiritual relationship with the God who created us. And so it's important for us as well, to be mindful of the temple, not to neglect the temple. And, and as I look at this story in Haggai, it reminds me of my need not to emphasize this world and, you know, setting up my own kingdom in it, but it's really how much attention do I put on my relationship with the Lord? I need the spiritual to be first, because that's what we'll see as we continue in Haggai, is that God's concern was they're all worried, people get all worried, and we do. We have a tendency to be worried about our circumstances, what's going on in our own life, you know, where are our resources going to go, and how am I going to get more, and all that. And we're so worried about life that we can neglect our Lord. And, and I think the real story of the book of Haggai is that we need to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's where we need to be. God's got to be first in every aspect of life. And when it isn't, as we'll see, uh, difficulties can arise. In Ephesians chapter 2, let me get there. I didn't review my notes this morning because I overslept. And then the phone was ringing. It's really convenient to have Jean in the hospital because she would have gotten me up sooner. <laughs> so I don't know why I have Ephesians 2, but we'll discover it together because I know it was a good point. So you wait, we'll get there. Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 22. says this, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So there's a, it's the same idea. That's why that's there. But it's a, another passage that gives us insight into the intense relationship that God desires us to have with him. He does not hinder that relationship. We are the ones who hinder that relationship. We're the only ones. God desires to be first in our life. But what are our priorities? You know, it's good to consider that. 
Because in 1 Timothy 4, 8 does say that godly exercise, I mean, exercise does, it is good for us. Let me read exactly what it says. Um, bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things. Having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So, you know, I mean, it's not like we should neglect our body as a, a physical flesh. <laughs> you know, we need to eat, we need to sleep, we need to drink, we need to have shelter, we need clothing, all these things. Those needs are important. They're not to be entirely minimized. It's just priority. And as I already shared, you know, Matthew 6, I might as well read that whole passage too. You guys aren't in a hurry to go anywhere. We're not that, we're, we're doing great. So, you know, we got plenty of time. But in Matthew chapter 6, 30, verse 31, it says, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So now back to Haggai. Haggai. However I want to say that. I'll bounce back and forth. So the prophet, in 520 BC, he hears from the Lord. And verse 2 says, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says the time has not come that the house, that the Lord's house should be built. And then the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Consider your ways. Think about it. You know, these, these exiles, as I said, they return to the land, but they're constantly harassed. They're discouraged. They're beaten down. But the Lord says, but, but think about it. And we need to do that, to take an account. Um, I got another reference in Jude. John, John, Jude, and Revelation. So it's in the back. Verses 3 and 4. Beloved, I, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I find it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we've got to earnestly contend. There are so many things in our world, so many things in each of our lives that will want to crowd in and want to push out this relationship, this time that we spend with the Lord. And yet, it's so important to consider our priorities. Consider what is most important. To seek first the kingdom of God. I didn't write down, but I know four or five times in this little book, he says the same thing. Consider, or this, consider your ways. Think. Don't allow circumstances to dictate who you are. Allow the Lord to dictate who you are. That's what he's saying to us. Consider your ways. Our choice day by day to daily walk that we need to have with the Lord. Ephesians 5. Let me get over there. Good to turn pages once in a while. Verse 8, Ephesians 5, 8 says this, For you were once darkness. That's true, we were. But now you are a light in the Lord. So walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful to even, even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. 
But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake, you who sleep. Arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly. You walk, looking around, being aware. Not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. We, and that is so true. If it was true then, boy, is it true now. What an evil day we live in. There's so much wickedness. We get, you know, we get used to stuff. It's real easy to get used to things. It's real easy to compromise. It's real easy to coast. Sometimes it's more comfortable, but the thing is, we never coast in the direction of righteousness. If you're coasting, you're coasting in the direction of untruthfulness, unfaithfulness, unrighteousness. It takes diligence to walk with the Lord. Jesus said, if anyone desires to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily. And follow me. It's daily, every day. Every day I gotta wake up and it's still me. I still gotta deal with me. I still gotta deal with my flesh, my temptations. I gotta do that every day. And I just say, Lord, I wanna reject those things. I wanna follow you today. I wanna be every day. It's what we need to do. And so back here, verse five, consider your ways. So when you think, and now we get a, an idea here of what their ways were. Because verse 6 says, you have sown much, but bring in little. You know, we're neglecting the Lord, and yet we want his blessing in our life. And Haggai is saying, it doesn't work that way. You've sown much, we worked hard. But bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. I've experienced that in the last couple of days. Yeah. <laughs> I've eaten a little, <laughs> but not enough. You know, you drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Boy, doesn't that ring true, doesn't it? Man, there's times I have worked so hard. You know, you're striving, you're trying to get ahead. You think, oh, man, that's good, you know? I remember when we first started budgeting, we, we set our budget up to do, we put money in an envelope every week for our monthly bills <coughs> on Friday because that's when we got paid. But there are four months a year where there's an extra Friday. And then we didn't have to put that money in an envelope, most of them, that week. That was party time. Was our, our budget was so tight. And we have this conviction that, you know, we wanted to be, uh, let our yes be yes, our no, no. We've made deals with all these people like the phone company and the power company and the mortgage company and all these, you know, that we're going to pay our bill. And so we had that conviction. We need to do that on time. But, see, the problem is I like to spend money. So... <laughs> That's a real problem. And uh, I have a wife who does like to pay bills on time. So thankfully, she takes care of me well. So we have, by God's <coughs> grace, 43 years of marriage. We've never been laid on a bill. The Lord has always provided everything we've needed. And we've always been able to pay. Now that may not be everybody's reality, but I know that God is faithful and, you know, and Anyway, it's important. I want my yes to be yes and my no, no. And there's times, though, when you that extra Friday is coming and we're going to have an extra, I don't know how much, $50, $100, I don't know. We go out to eat or do something. And then the car breaks down. Or, you know, some appliance breaks or, you know, hey, or somebody falls on a mountain, has to go to the hospital, or, you know, something happens, I know. <laughs> Those things come around, right? And, and there it goes. And now we're back behind. We're just catching up. We get behind. I've been there. You earn wages to put in a bag with holes. That's the way it seems. Money just has a way of flying away. You know, when we do things God's way, though, when we put Him first, 
And I'll be honest with you, and I, I didn't intend to go there, but we have tied for many, many years. And we have never been so secure financially as we started tithing. It's astounding to me how God can do more with the 90% when we give him 10 than we ever could do with 100%. It's amazing. It makes no sense. That, should, that don't work, you know? And it's the same with anything related to the Lord. I don't have time to pray. No, I don't have time not to pray, you know? I have much more time if I take the time to spend time with the Lord than if, well, Lord, I'm too busy today, so I'll, get, I'll, I'll check in with you tomorrow. It doesn't work. My day doesn't go as well, you know? It, this, there are spiritual realities in this physical world. And so many, you know, they, they're striving, they're, they're straining to do things. And yet, when you're outside of God's will, his blessing is hindered. That's the reality. It isn't that God stopped blessing them, but it's more like, he, first of all, he can't, reward unfaithfulness. He's never going to do that. We must be faithful. <coughs> but also the other aspect, you know, he's, he seeks to bless, he desires to bless, but we are not in, a, in his will. So he's, it's diminished what he's willing to do because he doesn't want to bless us in a way that will allow us to continue to drift away from us, uh, away from him. Right? So it's our fault, but his desire is to bless. <clears throat> but also, you know, wrong priorities. If our priorities are not right, it does create a false sense of what is important. And we will end up wasting our resources on unnecessary things. That's a reality as well. My priorities, as I walk with the Lord, my priorities have greatly changed. Things that used to be important. I used to love main hockey. I still like hockey. I like sports. I, I love those things. I used to go to almost every home game. Now think of that. Time with my family. The money I would spend going there to travel there to buy a ticket to go in. And you got to eat some food because everything's about food anyway with me. So you got to have some. When you think of all those things though, how many... How much of our resources was I spending just on my pleasure and my entertainment, you know? And my priorities have changed. That doesn't mean I don't watch a game now and then. I haven't been to one in a few years, but I like that. I'll probably go again soon. But it's no longer so important as it used to be. So it, it's important, you know, going back to verse 5, consider your ways, or here in verse 7, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. He says it again. Here in verse 7, consider your ways. You know, think, what is important? The way of blessing is obedience to the Lord. As we consider our ways, that's what we discover. <coughs> so, verse 7, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified. Now, interesting, he's telling me, you guys, go up there and get some wood up on the hill. See, when Cyrus sent them back 16 years before this, I'm going to pay everything. And not only that, he went, he sent, they were able to get cedars from Lebanon, just like <coughs> the first temple. So the cedar comes down and shows up, but it seems that they took those resources and put it into building their own houses instead of building the temple. He said, no, you're not going to Lebanon now. Now you guys go up in the mountains. You cut down the trees. That's the way it is now. I had already given you those resources. Now you go get the trees, you know. So go up to the mountains, bring the wood, and build a temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts? Because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore the heavens above you withhold the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. 
For I call for a drought on the land and the mountains, on the grain and the new wine and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock and all the labor of your hands. Because they had neglected the Lord, because they had gone after their own way, God says, okay, if you want your own way, I'll let you have it. But I'm not going to. I'm not going to go with you down that road. God pulls back on every aspect of their life. You know, the land and the mountains, a drought. The grain, the new wine, and the oil, the major crops, a drought. Whatever the ground brings forth, on man, on livestock, all the labor of your hands. <coughs> So choices, you know, is my life pleasing to the Lord? Am I in his will? Am I being obedient to what he desires? Am I following his will? That's a question we all have to ask. We all need to know. So Haggai gives these prophecies. He shares this with Zerubbabel and with um, Joshua. Saying, hey, this is what God's telling me, guys. How do you respond? And what a blessing. Verse 12 says, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the presence of the Lord. They respond appropriately. What an awesome thing. You know, if you look at Haggai, this whole book, all we have here is about three months where he prophesied to the people. He's out there telling them, this is what God's saying. And when we get into chapter two next week, we'll see, oh, they all, they responded well. And the blessing of the Lord begins again. And God's with them. Think of though <laughs> Jeremiah his whole life prophesying to the people of Israel. His whole life, to the best as we can tell, no one ever listened to a thing. <laughs> no one responded at all. See, results are always with God. But obedience is always our choice. And what a great thing when the people obey. They said, yes. What you speak, Haggai, that is from God. I recognize it. It is right. It's a good word. So verse 13 says, Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. That had to sound good. Because, where is it? I forgot to say this. Back in verse 2, you know, usually when the Lord talks about Israel, he will say, my people. In verse 2, though, he says, this people says the time has not come, the time that the Lord talks should be built. This people not my people. What a difference. And then, though, because there was a separation, but now the Lord says, I am with you. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the, all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month. In the second year of King Darius. 24 days later. Took that long. He, all right, Haggai hears from the Lord. He shares a message with the leaders. They get the people together. I'm sure they talk about it. They get a plan together. And they get busy. Away they go. And so on that day. And the cool thing is, and we'll, we'll read it more, we'll talk about it more next week, but in verse 10 of chapter 2, it says, On the 24th day, the same day, of the ninth month, so three months later, not the same day, three months later, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, No, that isn't where I want it to be. Verse 15. Carefully considered from this day forward, from before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord, since those days and so on. <coughs> I'll get there. Verse 18. Consider now from this day 
forward from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed still in the barn? As yet the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree has not yielded fruit, but from this day I will bless you. You know, amazing. God isn't going to wait till the temple is built. All he cares for is our heart to be moving in his direction. And he's right there, ready to bless. It's an awesome thing. The nature of God. So I'm going to close with a, a little passage in Lamentations. Which is after Jeremiah. In Lamentations chapter 3. Verse 40. Let this be our heart, <coughs> our prayer, our focus. Lamentations 3, 40 to 42. Because really 42 says, we have transgressed and rebelled. You have not pardoned. That's a reality. That was a reality for Israel. This is just as before they go into <coughs> captivity or, or Judah. But verse 40 says, let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. Let us lift up. Uh, let us lift our hearts and hands to God in heaven. What a great thought, you know. Not that you're not, but if you're not, let us do so. Because as I've seen my whole life, when I did not follow the Lord, things didn't go well. <coughs> so when he's first in my life, <coughs> even in the midst of difficulty or trial, he is an ever-present help in time of need. He is that. He's there. It's a wonderful thing. So consider those things. Let's stand, and we will close with hymn 461. Remember, we have a meeting right after, a business meeting. So hymn 461, he leadeth me. Lord, to serve you, to seek you, and to follow you all the days of our life. Lord, as we go now, we pray you go before us and bless us, bless our day, and we thank you, Lord, for 
just giving us uh, this last hurrah of summer. Help us to use our time wisely, redeeming the time for the days are evil. Thank you, Lord, again. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Thank you.